If you would, open your scriptures to Matthew chapter 16. We continue our look at uh, what it means to live a courageous life, living by faith and not fear. If our first graders are in the room, you got your new Bibles, what did I tell you? Put a bookmark in Matthew. That's where we were going to be for a while. So we're back there in Matthew chapter 16, uh, verses 21 through 27. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to to Jerusalem and to suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Dear Lord, we pray today that the words of my mouth, the meditation of each of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Some people seem to... Just, just show up on this planet fearless. You, you know some of these folks, right? They're the little kids whose parents are always terrified because, you know, they'll walk right up to the edge of something and jump off. Uh, you know, these are the parents who you, just, you can just tell. They're just frazzled because they are constantly on the lookout. I, I have good news for you. That wasn't my parents, at least not with me. I did not come out of the womb fearless. I was the kid who was always waiting around to make sure somebody else didn't die first uh, before I tried something. I I am cautious by nature. Uh, You know, that just goes with my personality. And so, you know, in life, I have found myself sometimes paralyzed by fear. We talked a little bit about that last week, that sometimes we allow fear to get the best of us so that we aren't willing to take really the very risk that God is calling us to take. Now, now, through the years, because of that, that's part of my personality, I've had to work on this. And so there are a few things that have helped me be a little more courageous than I am naturally. And one of those is I'm just good at math. Now, I know that really sounds strange, that, that courage could come from being good at math, but I learned very early about odds, right? And it helped me to put into perspective my fears. We learned a few weeks ago that I'm afraid of you know, taking off on the airplane. Pastor Clint is afraid of coming down on the airplane, but flying in general is not something I enjoy. Now, the trouble with that is I married a, a woman who loves to travel, and, and to travel to places you sometimes can't get to except by airplane. And so if I wanted to keep her happy, I had to learn to get on an airplane. And, and part of calming my fear was just recognizing the statistics you know these as well as I do, that, that we're a hundred times more likely to die in a car crash than we are a plane crash. And yet I get in my car multiple times every day without even thinking about it. That there's just something about human beings that often our fears are not aligned with, with what are the actual realities of living. I mean, we get scared of all sorts of things that probably are not going to happen, that statistically are, are a very uh, small probability, but because they're, they're, they're big events, because they are things that frighten us to no end, we pay attention to those. When the truth is, if we're really going to pay attention to what is most threatening to us, we would all be terrified of French fries, wouldn't we? All right? I mean, what's going to get us in the end more than likely is the fast food we eat, not, not some bad guy out there. And yet, we, we find ourselves terrified of those things that make the nightly news. Second strategy I have in overcoming my fears, being a little bit more courageous, is finding myself buddying up next to someone who's already done what I'm afraid of. This happened a few years ago with our best friends. We have the Barkers are a family from San Angelo, and just they have twin girls, Sophie's age. We, we've just gotten to be best buds through the years. And one of the things they loved was kayaking. And you may be saying, you can kayak in West Texas? 
you can. There are actually a few rivers out there. And, and there's one, the South Llano, runs through Junction, Texas. It's a wonderful little river to kayak because it's got a few rapids, but nothing over, overly scary. And so it's a great place to go with your family. And so we started going with the Barkers. Now, they're from West Texas, so they have done this over and over and over again. We got to one beautiful spot in the river where it kind of widens out and it's pretty deep and, and there's some cliffs over to the side and, and we decide to pull over and I think it's going to be we're going to pull over to just do a little bit of swimming. But they pull over and all of a the sudden they start scampering up the rocks up the cliff. Now all of a sudden all of my family members are looking at me because they know I'm a safety first kind of guy, okay? And they are looking at me, especially my children, with, with just this look, Dad, are you going to let us do this? And Allison is looking at me with that look that says, you should let them do this, but I'm not going to say anything because I'm a good wife and I'm not going to embarrass you here in front of the, chick, the children by calling you a coward, which was kind of her. But I read all of those looks and knew that peer pressure was going to get the best of me in this moment, even though I did not want to jump off of that cliff into that water. I looked at my children and said, all right, we can do this. We started climbing up, but I made sure, I was climbing in front of my children to go slow enough to make sure the barkers jumped off first. <laughs> all right? I mean, might as well see if they survive before we try it. The lesson, of course, is don't go somewhere dangerous with your pastor or he'll let you die first. Now, the real lesson is sometimes we can overcome fear if we journey with someone who has been to those places where we are afraid to go. The truth is we've now been to that spot more times than I can remember, and one of our favorite things to do every time we go is to jump off those cliffs into the water. In our passage today, Jesus' words help us employ really both strategies for overcoming fear it's suffering at the hand of, I'm going to say bad guys, but it's really more than that. Just, just fear of being hurt in this world, being found in dangerous places. And the truth is, again, we said that on average, uh, Americans, we're, we're so afraid of being hurt by bad guys. But the truth is, for every American that dies, say, at the hands of a terrorist, 1,600 die from accidental poisoning. And yet how many of us have worried about poisoning? It does say our perspectives are often just, they're not really aligned with reality. And Jesus really helps put our fear of the bad guys and suffering and death in the proper perspective in this passage, though probably not in the way we might expect. After all, he doesn't say, look, guys, it is statistically improbable that you are going to be harmed by bad guys. That's not what he says in this passage, is it? In fact, he goes in the opposite direction. They may have been tempted to think that because they may have been tempted to think we're with Jesus. He's close to God. Because he's close to God, it's probably true that God will watch over us and protect us all the time. They probably thought they were entering into a life of, of genuine safety because they were close to Jesus. And Jesus burst that bubble when he says to them in verse 21, I'm going to Jerusalem. There I will suffer many things. That phrase can actually be translated, I will suffer immensely at the hands of the leadership there, and I will be killed. The implication, of course, to the disciples is, if you go with me, you should expect some of the same. You may be thinking to yourself, Taylor, I thought this was supposed to help us put danger in its proper perspective, and yet you're here telling us that Jesus is saying to those who follow him, trouble is going to follow me, and if you choose to follow me, it will follow you too. Jesus is trying to put the danger we perceive in this passage in his proper perspective, and it begins with this news. In this world, you will have trouble, but as Jesus put in another place, he is going to overcome the world. Jesus was going to walk right into the worst trouble this world could bring, death at the hands of people who hated him. And yet he was going to walk willingly into that danger because he trusted that even in that danger, God the Father would not abandon him to the grave. That Jesus is walking this journey to show us that death itself is not something that we should fear. Now, we can only do that because Jesus was willing to do what? Go there first. 
go before us and overcome the grave. And all of these prophecies about his own death where he says, I will be killed, he also begins to tell them, but that will not be the end of the story. That God, our Father, he's not going to abandon me to the grave. That he's going to vindicate my faithfulness and he's going to raise me from the dead. So that all who face moments like this can have hope. That God will be faithful to them as well. The trouble that Jesus says we should really be worried about is not death itself. Because he says, I'm about to overcome death so that even if that's what somebody is threatening with you with, it's not something that really has as much power as you think. That the real danger for you is not that some bad guy is going to get you, but rather that God won't. Look at this passage in verse 25 and 26. He says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Remarkably, Jesus is saying in this passage that one of the things that you and I should be most afraid of is a preoccupation with safety that prevents us from following Jesus where he longs to lead us. That a preoccupation with safety, if we allow it to overcome our lives, can keep us from keeping up with Jesus. And what is the calling of a disciple? But to follow Jesus wherever he leads. Peter, we love Peter, right? Because he just, he's, he's us. And he, and he sticks his foot in his mouth and he says the things that we would say if we were in that place, but, 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 but you know, we're not bold enough. At least Peter was courageous enough to make a mistake. And, and in this passage, he makes a mistake because Jesus says this and, and Peter steps up and says, look, we're not gonna let that happen, Jesus. We're not gonna let, hap- we're not gonna let those people get a hold of you. We're not going to let this danger happen come your way. In many ways, Peter is speaking out of concern and care for Jesus. He wants Jesus to be safe. And yet his preoccupation with safety causes him to actually be in a position of complete opposition to the will of God. Notice what Jesus says to him. Some of the strongest words that Jesus has for any person in the New Testament, get behind me, Satan. He's saying that because what what Peter has done without even realizing it, and that's what happens in our lives. It's not that we wake up every morning and say, you know, I'd really like to see what Satan is doing today. It's just that sometimes in our cowardice, sometimes in our timidity, we find ourselves so fearful of the ways of God that we find ourselves opposing God's design for our life. And that's Peter. He's so concerned that everyone, especially Jesus, be safe, that that. That Jesus has to say to him, get behind me. You are a stumbling block to me. Jesus knows that often, in the name of safety, that you and I will do all sorts of things that lead us away from God. That, That we will bring violence on the people that God is trying to save. That in the name of security, we will forego the call to love our neighbors. The very thing that Jesus came to promote Jesus, Peter is really, do you understand what he's doing here? He's calling on Jesus to give up on the mission all for the sake of saving his neck. And Jesus said, the mission is for me to give myself for others. To give myself over to a pursuit of safety it would be to abandon the mission of God altogether. We may not notice it in the English, but Jesus' rebuke actually includes with it an invitation. He says, get behind me, Satan. Which, which is interesting because Jesus' very first words to Peter were what? Come and follow me. When you're following somebody, where are you in relation to them? I mean, if you're, if you're going to follow somebody, you're going to journey with them, but you're going to follow them, where are you going to be in relation to them? You're going to be behind them. Jesus' words of rebuke or or words of correction to say, Peter, you've gotten out ahead of me here and you're now leading us or trying to lead us to a place that I'm not willing to go because that's not where God wants us to go. Peter, get behind me where you're supposed to be all along following me, not where you want to go, not where you think is safe, but where I am leading. Peter, get behind me so that I can show you the way 
we are to go. We can take heart. We know that Jesus didn't want to die. Uh, we know that Jesus, it, it was human, he was fully human, and so his death on the cross was not somehow uh, something that was easy. It's not something that because he was God, you know, God dialed down the, the pain level on his nerve endings. That's not uh, it at all. We know that Jesus, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, on the eve of his betrayal, that, that he is, is so mindful of the pain and the, the, the tragedy that he is about to experience that the scriptures tell us he sweat drops of blood. The Bible is not telling us that you you and I need to be excited about suffering. What it is telling us is that we should have faith in God, that even our greatest fears in this life, the fear of suffering a painful death, cannot undo us, cannot steal us from the very presence of God. And what Jesus is saying is, let's focus on keeping that which is forever. Because he knows to try to save our life is a vain cause. I don't know about you, but the last time I checked, the mortality rate on this planet was still 100%. Right? You know, we can spend a whole life trying to save this life, which we will one day have to lay down. And in doing so, Jesus says you can lose your soul doing that. Spending your days trying to save something that has an expiration date. When all along within you resides a soul that will last forever. And Jesus says to you and to me, Look, if it comes to choosing one or the other, choose the one that lasts forever. Don't, don't spend a lifetime so preoccupied with your physical safety that you lose your soul. Instead, be willing to take a risk for my sake so that you might go where I lead. Now, we can do this on our own. I'll just be honest. My personality is such I couldn't do this to save my life, right? On my own, I'm not wired in such a way to take such risk for Jesus except for one fact. Jesus has already taken the plunge, right? He has already been the courageous one. He has already been the faithful one. He has already been the one who has journeyed through death and come out safely on the other side. Death is the one thing where it doesn't matter how many of those people that I love have gone before me, I don't have their testimony to tell me it's okay. But I do have one who's been to the grave and come out on the other side. And because of his testimony, the testimony of our resurrected Lord, I can face any danger because I trust that God will not abandon me to the grave. The disciples, takes them a little while to learn this lesson, doesn't it? I mean, Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem, and they will go with him, but what will happen that evening when he is crucified? They will scatter into the night. And even when news of his resurrection begins to circle out, at first they have trouble believing it. Who wouldn't it? And so what happens? They find themselves huddled together behind locked doors in a room. And there in that room, who shows up? Jesus himself. And they're like, you made it. You made it. We saw you die. You were dead. They put you in a grave. And here you are. You're right in front of us. It's like when my friend Brandon Barker went in the waters off the cliff the first time. He went under, and I just stood there waiting. I wasn't sure he was going to come up. He stayed under a long time. And finally he pops up, and I said, look at that. He lived. Friends, how much more so our Savior's resurrection? How many funerals have we gone to? How many times have we stood at a loved one's grave looking at what looks like the end? A reason for fear. Except that we have one who has risen from the grave. And you know what happened after that? It transformed the disciples from cowards into courageous proclaimers of the gospel, people who are willing to go to the ends of the earth, face any danger to declare the good news, Jesus lives. So too for our lives. 
If our life is marked by fear, you and I find ourselves in a world that gets smaller and smaller. There was a researcher uh, back in the 70s, Roger Hart, that he conducted on a, a survey uh, about where children felt safe to play. And he went into a little Vermont town, and he, I think he counted up 86 children. And he started doing interviews with these children. And he'd just say, show me where you play. And he would kind of trace where they would play in the city. And he, and he averaged out the distances for the children about how far from home did they feel safe playing. And, and in, that, in that time, he discovered that really by the time they got to be 10 years old in that town, that they would go all over the town. That if you ask the kids, where do we play, the answer would have been everywhere. Right? And then just a few years ago, 2014, he went back to that same Vermont town to interview the children of those children's children, their grandchildren, and did the same exact research. And what he found is, this is going to be no shock to you, that these grandchildren of the people who used to play everywhere, now no matter their age, played almost exclusively in their own yards. Maybe at a park if it was close enough to their house where their parents could see them. And he began to do the research. Has, has the crime rate in this town changed? You know, what has happened? And, and, and here's the thing. The statistically speaking, the crime rate in that town hadn't, hadn't increased at all. In fact, crime was almost non-existent in that town. It just wasn't a town that had a whole lot of crime. Over the generations, what had changed? People had become more fearful, hadn't they? That the only thing that really had changed was they had screens that showed them all the trouble in the world. And friends, I don't want to downplay that. There is real trouble in the world. But friends, sometimes we do have trouble keeping that in perspective. That in their immediate vicinity, they were still as safe as they had ever been. And yet what had happened? Because of fear, their world had shrunk down. I wonder about us, the church. How far into the world are we willing to go with the good news of the gospel? The answer to that question will largely determine, be determined by whether or not we are living by faith or fear. Fear keeps us close, doesn't it? Fear says we've got to stay with church people because you just don't know what's happening out there. Fear says, let's, let's stay where we know things are sort of safe. They don't always even feel safe here, but let's, let's stay and keep things close to the vest where faith says, I know that wherever I go, God goes with me. One of the ways we can measure whether or not we are living by faith or fear is what steps we're willing to take for Jesus. Where are we willing to go that he leads we might put it in the opposite question today for each of us. Where am I unwilling to go if Jesus leads? That might determine where fear has a hold of us. Maybe you're unwilling this morning. I'm just flat scared to actually make a decision for Christ public. Maybe God's been working in your heart, but just the very idea of standing up in front of other people and saying, I'm ready to follow Jesus. Maybe you're afraid of what your family will say. Maybe you're afraid of, of, of what changes might come about in your life. Maybe you're afraid of, of giving up control of your life. Maybe you're afraid of giving up the sin that, honestly, some days you really like. Maybe fear has a hold of you that's keeping you from simply trusting Jesus as Lord. Maybe others of you are afraid to commit to a church family because let's just be honest, to love anyone is to open ourselves up for suffering, even a church family. That to love other people, to trust them with, with our lives is, is to open ourselves up to being hurt. And I want you to know that's a real danger in this world. But the, the opposite of that is not love with safety. The opposite of, of love without vulnerability is just not love. That to love others is to be vulnerable. Maybe you're not connecting to this church or not reconnecting. Maybe you've been a part of this church in the past, uh, but, but because of events, because of being hurt by someone, you've kept on the fringes. Maybe because of fear, you find yourselves on the fringes of this church's life, afraid to commit or recommit because you're afraid of being hurt once again. Maybe you're afraid of sharing the good news with a neighbor or a family member, or a friend. You're not sure what they would say. What if, what if they think I'm a religious freak? What if they criticize me? What if they stop hanging out with me? You know, maybe fear is keeping you from sharing your faith. 
Maybe fear is keeping us from just following Jesus in all the ways he asks us to follow him. By, by loving our enemies or, or praying for those who persecute us or forgiving someone who has offended us. In all of those places, we are taking big risk for Jesus. We are. And it doesn't mean that, hear me well, because we know there are real dangers in this world. And we want to be shrewd, Jesus says in one passage. But, but shrewdness is not the same thing as abandoning the love of God. So what does it mean to take a risk to love those who might wish us harm or who have offended us along the way? Maybe fear is keeping us from just obeying some of Jesus' most basic commands. I don't know. I guess it's for all of us. There is some place we find ourselves struggling to go because we are afraid. I have good news for you today. Wherever that is, Jesus has already stood in that place. Wherever that is, Jesus has already been there to show us what faithfulness looks like, what it means to... to to proclaim the good news of God, what it means to, to, to invest in people and love them even knowing that they would hurt him, what it means to love one's enemy and to forgive those who harm you. Wherever it is you're afraid to go, I've got good news. Jesus is already there saying, hey, hey, come and follow me. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we thank you that you are a courageous God. I mean, the whole story of the scriptures is you taking a risk on us. That, that Lord, I mean, when nothing existed, how safe must have that been just for you to be? And yet you took the risk of making us, and giving us free will so that we might have a genuine relationship with you. Lord, knowing that we would use that free will to sin against you. Lord, even then, the you were courageous enough not, not to just do away with us, not to just punish us forever, but, Lord, to make a way for us to be redeemed. And it meant becoming one of us in the person of Jesus Christ, of, of walking this earth to know what it was like to be hungry and tired, to know what it was like to be betrayed, and, and, and Lord, to know what it was like to be murdered. Lord, you were courageous enough to do all that so that we might be infused with your courage to live our lives as well. Lord, to be able to face even death itself with the courage knowing Jesus has overcome the grave. So Lord, we pray that you would help us to be a courageous people, not because of our might, not because of our power, not because of our care, but because of yours. Why can we be courageous in this world? We can be courageous because you are here with us and you love us and you've promised to never leave us or forsake us so Lord we can count on you Lord I pray each of us this morning would be able to hear that good news to believe and to be brave we pray this in the name of Jesus our Lord Amen